All right. There we go. Sorry for the delay here, folks. We had a little bit uh, trouble getting things going here with uh, my computer this morning. But um, thank you for all your patience. Uh, hope you, hopefully you guys are all in the right webinar. <laughs> Again, this is the uh, Queensbury Union Free School District um, Enabling Digital Learning with Meraki webinar. So definitely excited to have you here today. Uh, so just as a quick agenda, we'll go through a little bit about um, Cisco Meraki, uh, and then we'll get specifically into the into the Queensbury uh, case study here. And then after that, we will go through a live demo uh, and an overview of our product families. Uh, at the end of the session today, we will have about uh, 10 or so minutes for a quick Q&A session. Uh, so uh, definitely be sure to have your questions ready. But if you do have questions throughout the presentation, I have my colleague Tanya here with me today. She'll be online and fielding your questions via the questions bar there. So definitely utilize that. Ask the questions as they pop in your head. That'll give her a chance to answer them, and then we'll cover kind of the common questions at the end. All right, so just a little bit about Cisco Meraki, uh, just in case this is your first time ever hearing about us. Uh, we are a complete cloud managed networking solution. So uh, when we say complete, we are not just like a cloud services company, right? We don't just sell like a software that you kind of layer on top of your traditional network, right? What we mean by this is that we sell a complete hardware, software, and cloud services solution all bundled into one, right? So we have our own line of access points, uh, security appliances, switching, and also a very uh, unique and intricate MDM solution. So uh, very excited to kind of show you all those products today. Um, of course, this is a approach that led us to really become the leader in cloud managed networking, right? This is not something that was ever an afterthought for Meraki, right? From our very beginnings, we had cloud management in mind. So hopefully that approach and, and that kind of organic nature of the dashboard uh, really shines through during our demo today. Uh, we've also been recognized for innovations, standard industry leaders here at Gartner Magic Quadrant, um, InfoWorld Technology of the Year, and also one of CRN's coolest technologies. Uh, we are in thousands of K through 12 campuses. Our, our, our public sector team has just really done an excellent job of, of kind of uh, identifying uh, school districts as kind of one of our key verticals. Um, and uh, you'll see just a, a listing here, and this is kind of just you know, scratching at the surface. So um, definitely, if you ever needed to kind of have some more information about how K through 12 campuses, uh, you know, use Meraki solutions, uh, we're we're be quickly becoming a, an expert on that. All right. So just to give you real quick, just a, a quick breakdown of kind of of the fundamentals of kind of what cloud managed networking is. So. Uh, the first thing to kind of understand here about cloud managed networking is that uh, you know no user traffic passes through the cloud. So as we go through the dashboard today, one of the things you'll notice is kind of the deep uh, level of, uh, of information that we have about what's going on inside of your network. And but what I mean by that is just the the amount of application visibility that we have, um, the granular controls that we have over uh, the different types of applications on your network. Um, a lot of folks think when they see this that you know we must have to send this data to the cloud in order for it to be you know kind of crunched at that point. Um, and, and that's just not the case, right? We do all the analytics on our actual gear that lives inside of your network and only that analytic information is passed back up through the cloud. So your user traffic as kind of illustrated here to your left, uh, that user traffic is really going to go right out your local WAN connection and only the management and analytic information is going to go across this kind of secured interface to the cloud. Our backend system is also fully HIPAA and PCI compliant. Uh, we do, of course, third-party security audits to, to kind of maintain that. Um, we also have automatic firmware and security updates. So, you know, leveraging that cloud infrastructure, this is probably one of the coolest things that we can do, right? Uh, when we can say automatic firmware updates, you can actually, with a few clicks, schedule updates to thousands of devices in geographically dif uh, dispersed locations, right? So, um, no need to kind of go site by site or device by device to do firmware updates. Updates. Um, and also by security updates, what's kind of cool here is that like when you use our security appliance, um, what you can do is actually have uh, you know automated malware detection and, and source fire IDS IPS rule sets kind of updated in the background on every hour uh, to the device. So some really cool things that we can do there leveraging the cloud infrastructure. 
Uh, our architecture is also extremely scalable, right? Our wireless architecture does not include any wireless controllers. So if you're if you're talking about scaling out to, um, you know, different districts or to school, schools of different sizes, um, it, it, there's no kind of com complexity there. Um, so no, no uh, bottlenecks on your land there. It's very very easy to dev uh, add new devices or even new locations. Uh, within just a matter of minutes. We have a lot of nifty tools built into the dashboard to enable that. Um, and finally here, reliability. The cloud, we have multiple cloud instances, right? So we have three different data centers here in the US, uh, multiple over in Europe as well. So um, a high availability cloud model with the four nines uptime there. And the last thing to kind of take away from this is that, you know, the cloud uh, infrastructure is there for you to kind of log into and, and configure the dashboard and, and configure your devices, but that your network will continue to function even if you do not have cloud connectivity. And what I mean by that is like if you lose WAN connectivity for you know, a couple hours or something like that while your ISP is working on something. It's not like your LAN is not going to know what to do, right? So uh, the configuration for your devices lives on the devices uh, and, uh, you, you know, your LAN will continue to function there. So if there's any other questions that kind of pop up around this, of course, ask them in the toolbar here. But also a great link for you to check out is that meraki.cisco.com forward slash trust there. Uh, that, that's going to be a great resource for you to kind of get some more information about kind of how this backend system works. All right, so just a couple things here to highlight uh, of why Meraki, Cisco Meraki is a great fit for the K-12 environment. So, you know, I, I haven't heard of too many schools that have uh, an excess of IT guys, right? So uh, having an intuitive uh, kind of management plane where you can kind of log into the dashboard, see the, the health of your entire infrastructure from one single pane of glass um, without the complexity of kind of other, of ne of other networking vendors uh, is pretty powerful, right? So uh, being able to, to kind of have that information right at your fingertips while you know uh, maintaining maybe another function at the school right you're not the dedicated IT person so um, really really powerful there um, and you know the last thing here is that full stack solution right so we have a full stack of access point switches security MDM all of those things can be managed by the one single spot in the dashboard uh, flexibility, right? So um, when you are talking about like you know a, a kind of a lean IT staff and you're maybe centralized at the maybe the district headquarters or at one particular school, being able to do troubleshooting for remote locations, right? Having pa built-in packet capture and live tools. Uh, diagnostics built into the dashboard uh, would be very, very easy. Also, zero touch site provisioning. So what we mean by that is that you can actually configure Meraki equipment while it's in transit to a location. Right? So once you have your, your kind of Meraki order number or the serial number of the devices, it's very, very easy to manipulate that configuration. And then when it gets to the site, you just have to have someone plug it in and uh, have it have access to the internet. It'll automatically reach out to the cloud and download its configured. And so uh, no longer do you have to have to kind of ship gear to your centralized location and then reship it out to where it's actually going to be installed, we can kind of simplify that. And the last one, like I mentioned earlier, just a, just a ton of visibility into what's going on in your network, right? So when you talk about controlling what students have access to, controlling uh, what applications are in use during what times of day, um, there's just a, a lot of buttons and knobs when it comes down to controlling this. Uh, but even though there's a lot, but a lot of buttons and knobs, uh, it, it's still very uh, intuitive and easy to use, uh, and we'll, we'll be able to demo that today. All right, so at this point, I will pass it over to uh, Bernie Capron here. He's the uh, District Network Coordinator. So, uh, Bernie, take it away. Okay, here I am. Um, not sure what I'm supposed to talk about, though. Oh, okay, excellent. So, we'll, uh, we'll have a uh, – well, why don't you introduce yourself first, Bernie? <laughs> Okay, uh, my name is Bernie, and I am a uh, network coordinator for Queensbury Union Free School District. Uh, we're a school district in, uh, well, northern New York State. Uh, we're in the Lake George area, for anybody familiar with uh, New York. And uh, we have 3,500 students and about four to 500 staff. And so it was, uh, we're, we're a little over three years uh, into a Meraki system. We, we sat down three years ago, we were replacing uh, an aging HP uh, system that was that was working for us, but gosh, at that time it was um, it was wireless G, um, and each access point had to be managed individually. I had to log into each one. There was software available to let you centrally manage it, but it was it was clunky at best. So we started looking around for a different solution, and I was very unfamiliar with with cloud-based solutions. They were 
fairly new, but there was a couple of companies that were doing it. And um, to make a long story short, we we settled on Meraki, and uh, we've been very very pleased with it since. Uh, Ryan, some good points with um, how easy it is to access things and and just look. Um, it's very tweakable, uh, which is something that I appreciate, and it's just uh, really awesome to look into it and be able to see different things. I, I have a, a few stories to tell about things that I've done. Even um, recently this morning, I was able to locate a stolen iPhone. Um, the uh, the kid never turned off the wireless, so I was able to, to locate where it was um, and uh, and actually the, the kid fessed up to it. So that's just one story, but I, I mean there's there's lots of different instances um, basically day in and day out that, that we use uh, the dashboard for to, to manage our network. I've, I've got about 137 access points and I think we have 48 switches. Um, so that's that's where we're at and, and we match uh, the entire network. There's There's three of us um, actually, two and a half. There's two full-time uh, desktop technicians, and then I'm kind of a hybrid. I'm, I'm also a desktop technician, but I'm also the, the network guy. Um, so, so that's where we fall. Um, you know, and we're all able to log into the dashboard and, and troubleshoot and relocate access points, and uh, we use it every day for, for a multitude of things, and it's, it's very convenient. Excellent. Thanks, Bernie, for for kind of sharing your your kind of use case there. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, pretty exciting. Now, uh, Bernie, do you happen to have like an example of, of maybe you know? Can you take me through one of those stories where you had to do some type of uh, remote troubleshooting or anything like that? Have you do you have any examples where you could uh, highlight that for us? Well, we've we do remote troubleshooting uh, a lot. Um, you know, with we use Chromebooks here. Uh, we have about 3,800 of them in the school district, and so you know we're constantly looking at the network to see you know what the density of the traffic is and the, the number of devices connected, and uh, we use that information to to move things around. So you know a specific uh, scenario would be to to look into a classroom and, and see what's going on. And if a teacher calls me and says, oh, the internet's slow or, um, you know, I can't hook on with this Chromebook or, or that device or, or whatever. In fact, I, I just got an email from one of my principals. She's uh, having trouble with her phone. Um, and just through the dashboard, it allows me to see what's going on. And that's always been kind of the holy grail for me is, uh, you know, the, you know this information is there. It's just being able to mine it and, and use it so that you can actually say, yeah, this is where your problem is. And the dashboard does that very, very well. Um, there's there's different ways to, to look at the traffic. Uh, maybe, Ryan, you can demonstrate that or, um, you know, if there's questions about it. There, there's different ways to, to look at, at current traffic from multiple devices, uh, access points, switches, um, you know, there's just different ways to look at, at many different things. It's also uh, good to look at, at traffic from, from different sites. Um, I'm on the traffic analytics page right now, and I'm, I'm just seeing, you know, what sites are being used. Uh, we're a Google Apps school district here. We use Google Apps now. Uh, so I'm, I'm seeing, you know, tons of Google traffic. Uh, and, you know, and it makes sense, uh, but I'm also seeing other switches in my network that are talkative. Um, I've been able, I had an issue uh, a while ago uh, with two, uh, I had a tremendous amount of traffic coming from one switch, um, you, you know, where, where most of my switches pass, yeah, it's 10 to 15 gigabytes a day, give or take. I had one switch that was moving 50 to 80 gigabytes a day, and, and we were just trying to figure out why the, that switch was so so intense, um, and you know, by looking into it, we discovered that, that, that there was a classroom there hooked to that switch, which we knew, but we didn't realize how much traffic they were passing. But also, uh, I had forgotten that I had two IP cameras on that uh, switch as well, and the IP cameras were just turned right up. They were pushing, I, I want to say, uh, 60 frames per second, and you know, full-blown HD video, and we were able to turn down the cameras and, and back them off a little bit so that they weren't basically flooding that switch with uh, with traffic. But I guess the thing that's important to mention is that even with that amount of traffic going through, I, we really didn't, I, I noticed it just because I looked, not because there was a problem. Um, we really don't have problems. I, I was very skeptical at first about uh, 
cloud connecting. And Ryan, I'm glad you brought that slide up with uh, showing that the management traffic is actually very low, that most of the traffic does stay in the network. You know, if you have a device trying to get to a file server that's in your network, that traffic's going to stay in your network. Um, the management traffic going out will, will indicate where that device connected, but as far as the actual traffic, it's, it's not going out to a data center who knows where and back. Uh, it's staying inside your network. And we've also uh, lost our ISP before and, uh, you know, no issues. We've, we've been down. Um, it doesn't happen too often. Uh, generally, we're down for, for minutes at a time. But we have had a couple instances where we were down for half a day. Um, and the network just, you know, went right along. We didn't have any internet, um, but we were able to uh, to keep moving. I mean, nothing nothing stalled. Uh, you know, since we lost the connection to Meraki, uh, they do keep moving along. Um, and you are able also to log in locally to the switch. I mean, in an extreme example, if you have a switch that won't communicate with the network, uh, which actually I do right now, um, I've, I've got one that's uh, misconfigured, and I'm going to need to go out and hook a laptop to it. Uh, even then, you can log into it. They have a, a simplified dashboard for that switch, um, and I can look in and, and reconfigure it, change the IP address, change the gateway, change the VLAN. Um, so there's there's a simplistic view that you can use logging directly to the switch. So it's, it's not like you're offline if there's no cloud. Um, that was something that, that we were very concerned with in the beginning and it's, it turned out to be pretty much just a myth. We've, we've really moved on from it. Um, it's understandable. I mean, if the network goes down and you can't see this dashboard, uh, you know, it's, it can be a, a pain point, but as far as daily business, it, it doesn't stop. Uh, things do keep moving, at least from the end, end user's point. Um, so, you know, that's what I'm most concerned about. You know, can, can my classroom teachers still continue to do their work? And, and yes, they can. Um, so we see, uh, we've also had a tremendous uptick um, since we've installed this system. Uh, we have a public wireless that's available in the afternoon. Um, and we just have a tremendous number of kids that have uh, phones and, and we have uh, an open network. Uh, so we've gone from generally one to 200 clients a day um, to right now on my traffic analytics board, I, I'm showing 4,100 unique clients today. Uh, so that's that's quite a bit. That's that's actually more people than we have in the school district. So we're lo we're we're looking at multiple devices here. You know, a teacher may use a computer and a phone and a tablet. So uh, and you know, it we're, we just move right along. We've we've gone from 100 to 200 devices to over 4,000, and still just moving right along. We, we haven't seen any uh, degradation in traffic flow or, or anything. We, we've been talking about getting uh, 10 gigabyte uh, GBICs for our switches. Uh, we have um, one gigabit uh, GBICs for our switches now. So every, uh, every uh, MDF is um, one gigabit back to the main core switch. So uh, yeah, I, I mean that's, we're, we just, we've been using it for three years. It works very well for us. Uh, I, I hope I don't want to babble on, so I, I, I hope that I'm, I'm, I'm maybe answering some questions or you know getting a few head nods in there, and, and people say, yeah, this this is looking good. Yeah, Bernie, thanks for that. I mean, this just of course adds just a ton of context, right? So uh, you know, me being here at Meraki, you know, it, it might come across as you know often salesy, but it, it's great to hear from an end user, kind of to validate all the things that I, I hope people take advantage of when using a Meraki uh, dashboard. Um, one thing you did mention there that I'd love to have you, um, you know, maybe elaborate a little bit further on was, uh, you know, you mentioned there's a bunch of different ways to get access to the dashboard, right? And, and uh, do, have you ever actually used the, the Meraki mobile app to kind of troubleshoot a center where maybe like your, your land's down, so now you're using a cellular connection to kind of do some, um, you know, troubleshooting there? Yes. Um, I use the mobile app occasionally. I don't use it. Uh, all the time, but I generally because I, I don't like the small screen on my phone. Sure. Um, but uh, but it is available, and and I actually had a, an emergency. Uh, it's about six months ago. Um, we were all out to lunch, and I got a phone call, and I had to turn on a wireless network for a presenter, and I I did it from my phone while we were sitting there waiting for lunch. Uh, I wasn't anywhere near the school district, so. 
uh, yeah, it, you can use it uh, mobile. Uh, you can use it uh, since it's a website. Uh, I'm I'm have a tendency to be on multiple types of computers. I, I use a um, a Windows computer here in my office, but I also have a Mac. I I have tablet, I have Linux computers, and since it's a website and it's available as long as you have an internet connection, um, you know, it works. I, I've been on vacation in Florida and done things. Uh, I had a, another urgent situation. Uh, I was at a presentation uh, in Albany, New York. Uh, this was just a few months ago. And once again, I, I jumped on a Chromebook. Uh, we were actually getting ready to present, and I'm furiously working in the corner working on a problem on the network here at school to, to get things resolved and get, get things back working again. So yeah, I, I guess that's something you just take for granted now. I, I can't imagine life without it, uh, being able to access it from anywhere. I, I do work from home uh, in the evening. Uh, if I've uh, if I've got things to change around, or I just want to look in and you know see what's going on, um, it it works very very well for that. I most of my usage is just visual, just to say, oh yeah, what's what's going on today? You know, how's the high school humming along? What's going on at the middle school? I just like to keep tabs because sure. I I find problems quite often just by casually looking over things and and seeing what's going on, and I I can spot a problem fairly quick. Um, I noticed the other day um, our sixth grade uh, area uh, in the middle school was uh, jammed up pretty good and I ended up putting two more access points there to um, you know to make things work better. So it's just things that that you you know you, you can always hope to identify a problem before it occurs and with this dashboard you're able to do that. I, I don't want to sound like a Meraki commercial and I, I think <laughs> I, I might actually be but I, I do talk very positive about this product. Um, you know like I say we've been using it for we're a little over three years in now um, and you know I'll, I'll never go back so to speak. Uh, it's 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 really been a, a life has changed. It's It's been a, a real game changer for the way we do business. There's no way that we could have scaled to this size without this type of a system. Now, you know, maybe you can do the same thing on a controller network versus a cloud network, but I really like the fact that you can just log in from any type of device anywhere that you have an internet connection. Um, and that's just been a very, a huge bonus for me. Excellent. Thanks, Bernie. Um, I do have a question for you from uh, from our attendees today. Uh, one one uh, uh, person would like to know, do you use Meraki in conjunction with the Google Classroom? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, we are, uh, we're Google Apps. Uh, I like to say we're all Google all the time. Um, we, um, we use Google Apps here. We use Google Classroom. Uh, we are, we're real heavy. The teachers are heavy with uh, YouTube videos. Um, so this, this network really gets pounded during the day. Um, during the school day, it's, it really, it, it gets hit hard. Um, after Four o'clock, you can hear crickets here. But boy, I'll tell you, during the during the day, uh, we, you know, we're not a 24-hour network, so to speak. Um, my internet connection is 350 megabits, um, and we don't top out during the day. But we're we're bouncing along between eh, 150 to 250 uh, during the day for our internet connection. So yes, we we do use this in conjunction with Google Classroom um, and lots of other apps that are part of our world. Um, you know, we use Khan Academy, we use a product called Kahoot, we have a reading server, um, uh, lots of stuff going on here. Uh, lots of lots of internet type stuff. Uh, we're, we're really heavily into internet usage here. Excellent. And uh, last one here, Bernie, and then we'll get on to the uh, live demo. So maybe just tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, got you, you know, you guys, of course, started with, uh, you know, wireless and switching. And maybe tell me a little bit about uh, the kind of the looking at security appliance and, and kind of what you're considering there. Well, when we bought our security appliance uh, a few years ago, this was before we looked at Meraki. So I, I don't have a Meraki security appliance. Uh, nor do I have a Meraki web filter. Um, I, I have the Meraki, um, the the switches, um, and the wireless access points. Okay, excellent. So yeah, maybe I'll touch on you know during the demo kind of some benefits and can you know how this could even help out your network. So um, we'll definitely get into that. Yeah, we we looked at the Meraki product, uh, but it was but it was after the fact. Um, Absolutely. The, they they came out with the uh, with the security appliance after we had already bought it, um, 
but I, I have looked at it, and you know, it did look good. Uh, but I, I'm not an expert on it because I don't use it. Sure, absolutely, great. Well, hey, Bernie, th thanks again, and um, you know, we'll be sure uh, at the end we'll, there might be some more questions for you. So thanks for uh, thanks for the uh, kind of context here, and really, we really appreciate having you on. Okay. All right, excellent. So hang tight here. And uh, so yeah, let's get into a live demo. So um, I'm gonna kind of get out of, uh, of PowerPoint here, and I'm gonna go to. I'm just gonna walk you guys through the kind of dashboard login process. So if I go to dashboard.meraki.com here, and I can go ahead and log in uh, with my credentials. Hopefully, I type my password correctly. Perfect. All right. So, uh, what I just wanted to show you here, real quick, is um, you know this is a this is a view that as an admin uh, we can see here, and I just wanted to kind of highlight a couple things here. So, I actually started with uh, Meraki a little over three years ago, so maybe around the time that uh, Bernie was uh, getting ready to deploy his first Meraki network. And um, at the time, uh, this number of active networks here, this was about. Uh, uh, 80,000 networks. So, uh, and you, as you can see here, we're rapidly approaching the 500,000 active network uh, kind of uh, milestone here. So this, this, this is pretty exciting for us. And it, by the way, this is not like uh, you know individual devices. This is like groups of devices into a network, right? So. Um, some very, very uh, exciting growth for us here at Meraki, and, and really the map here kind of reflects a lot of that. Um, so we can see we're, we're pretty much you know everywhere in the U.S. and Europe, and then we're expanding into our Latin America market, um, expanding into our APJ market, right? So um, we're really growing. Uh, not only at this point, uh, you know, here in the U.S., uh, but also worldwide. So some very exciting stuff for us here. Um, and the last thing I wanted to kind of, you know, uh, let you know here is as you guys kind of get closer to maybe considering Meraki and you start engaging with your sales rep, we're going to be able to show you networks here um, that get, that are exactly like you know uh, different school districts here. So we could show you kind of how other schools do things and show you kind of some information about their specific networks that kind of as it would pertain to you guys. So for today, guys, I want to show you. Um, I'm going to dive into the Meraki Corp network here. So um, you know, I understand this is not necessarily set up as a network that's a K2 through 12 network, but uh, I do want to uh, you know highlight a couple things here. So actually, you know, actually, I just uh, was getting a, a notification here that uh, Bernie offered to let us uh, show off their network. So hang tight one second. Let me bring up that link here. Can you link? You linked it to me in chat. All right, excellent. Sorry about that. I wanted to, to kind of bring up uh, uh, his specific network here. So um, what we're going to take a look at here is the actual live network that, that Bernie manages today. So hopefully I don't uh, – uh, I actually haven't seen Bernie's network before, so we're going to dive through it. Um, so let me start here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to this uh, org overview page here. And, and really what I want to show you here is just how at a glance you can kind of log in and see the health of your networks, right? So you can see Bernie has multiple networks here. He has a, his systems manager network, and then all of his actual school devices are all kind of located in one network. Network here. Um, so when you first log into the dashboard, you're going to get to get this high-level overview, kind of the health of your entire infrastructure. So um, let's go ahead and look into uh, uh, the QF, QUFSD network here. And the first page we'll land on here is this clients page. So uh, you know this is a, a lot of information and and some very basic things to kind of understand about this page is that we didn't have to uh, you know 
upload a list of MAC addresses or anything like that into this page. All the kind of client visibility that we're getting here, uh, this is all something that happens dynamically as new clients connect to the network. Uh, and there's a lot of like kind of filtering that we can do here, right? If we just wanted to say, hey, I want to see all uh, of my different you know clients connected to a particular SSID, or maybe I just want to see all my wireless traffic, right, as opposed to wired traffic. And then we can also go expand this out to maybe the last week, uh, last month, etc. Right. So uh, you can see kind of the you know peak you know usage here is, is school hours uh, at, you know are in, are in session here, and you can kind of see over time uh, how the traffic flow changes. Um, other things that you can do on this page. You search. So if you want to search for Windows devices, uh, you can search for operating systems here. If you want to search for a type of device like an iPad, um, you can do that. If you know you're looking for, you know, a particular student, uh, you know, and, and you know that, hey, this is their, you know, their maybe let's just pick a name since I saw it on the list there. Let's choose that we're looking for, you know, some student named Peter, um, and we search for Peter. We can. It also searches the host name information, right? So uh, as you're kind of like trying to dive in and understand what's going on on the network. Uh, uh, you have some nifty search tools here. The other thing that's quite useful is sorting by usage, right? So if you want to say, hey, what's my what's my top client that's being used uh, on the network? We can sort here by usage and get that information as well. Now you might have noticed this uh, kind of wheel of fortune looking thing off to the side here. This is our application breakdown. So if we hovered over, you know, these different uh, categories here, we'd be able to see kind of different categories of traffic. And if we expanded this out, we can actually get a kind of more granular view of this. So let's sort again by usage here, and we can see, you know, like Bernie mentioned, they you know a lot, use a lot of Google services. So we see a lot of, of course, Google and Google Video traffic here. Uh, if we pull down the list here, of course, you know, no school would be complete without some Facebook traffic, and it does look like it's about 2.6 gigs uh, over the last week. And if we wanted to kind of click on that and kind of understand, you know, what, which students or devices are, are kind of most heavily utilizing this application, uh, we can click on that application and it'll load kind of a, a list view of all the different uh, students that have been using this service. So. Uh, and we can also see over time, you know, what parts of the day were, you know, they were using that service at. So, um, again, some very, very useful and granular information here uh, that we can use to kind of, you know, pinpoint exactly what's going on on the network. Uh, Bernie, anything you want to add in here? Uh, Mary might be muted. Yes, yeah, I, oh, no, I'm here. I had to, I had to <laughs> unmute. <laughs> so anyway, well, I, I, I think I wanted to point out to you, if you search the dashboard uh, for uh, Brandy, uh, B-R-A-N-D-I, um, uh, right there, Brandy's iPhone, um, you'll see it's offline right now because she, she just left. But this was the iPhone that was stolen this morning. Um, and I was able to locate it just by going here and, and clicking on her phone. and. Uh, it indicated to me that it was on a specific access point, and it was a, a very strong signal. I, all right, I guess it says she's still here. You see, it's she's near the high school main entrance, so I, I think she's probably practicing uh, either sports or something, uh, you know, because school is uh, letting out very shortly, uh, if it hasn't now. Um, so anyway, this is one of the ways that I use to, to track, you know, what's going on. Uh, so this is the way that I, I found her phone, and, and I, I identified which room it was in because the signal strength was so good. Um, and I, I called that teacher, and the teacher kind of pulled everybody aside and said, hey, somewhere in this room there's a stolen iPhone, and we want it back. And the uh, the kid uh, dropped it off on the desk later. So, <laughs> you know, it, sometimes it, you know, it doesn't always happen that way. You, you hope it will, but it doesn't always happen that way. But just the same, it gave me a pretty good idea of, of where that phone was located. And, and so this is very handy to locate devices. Excellent. That's perfect. Yeah, so uh, again, you know, you'll be able to see kind of a, on a client by client level, like, again, what where they're at on the network based on what access point they're associated with. We can see that client specific data in terms of usage and again, uh, kind of their breakdown of applications as well. So yeah, again, some real, very rich information here that we can get about these devices. So um, let's kind of pivot from this. So I, I want to make sure we're going to squeeze in a lot of information here in the next kind of 10 to 15 minutes. So I want to kind of highlight a couple of things here. So thing, let's take a look at the access points page. Uh, we'll see a list view of every single one of their access points, right? So and you can see that they've gone 
through named all the access points to kind of something that uh, means something to them, right? So these are all basically room names, which makes a ton of sense in a school environment. Um, so this is going to help you uh, kind of later on manage this network. Now, uh, you can see all these devices are green. We can see connectivity history, right? So we know none of these devices have gone down over the last day. We can see some channel information here, right? So we can see uh, which uh, the current settings all of these guys are on, what IP address they have. Uh, again, just a ton of information here. Now, um, if we click on one of these, let's actually, let's do one thing. Let's uh, find the one that has the most number of clients connected to it. So it looks like room 107 has the most number of clients today. So we'll click on that and we'll get a nice nice view of, of a bunch of information here, right? So first being which SSIDs are currently turned on on this access point. Uh, we can see that a couple of these are like time-based ones, right? So we can see, hey, they're off right now because of a, some time-based uh, mechanism. But we can see IP, again, public IP address information. We can see channel information. We can see all the different iPads that are connected to the device. We can see their signal strength, what channel they're on, uh, their usage, how long they've been associated for. Uh, again, just a wealth of information. And then getting into like you know different troubleshooting options, right? So looking at tools, right? What if we want to say, hey, you know, maybe Bernie here gets a phone call that, hey, none of my iPads are getting out to the internet. The first thing you can do is come in here and say, hey, you know, can the access point itself reach the internet, right? And we can actually send a ping to like Google.com or whatever else you'd like to you know send here, and you can see that yeah we got loss rate of zero percent so you know that that's a great troubleshooting mechanism if you did want to run like trace route or look at the channelization you know reboot the AP if you know if you really think it's being funky um, you know all those options here are available to you here in the dashboard but also on that mobile app that we were talking about earlier and also internally uh, on the left hand side you can see the internal IP address so I can ping the access point internally as well and you know that's been a big help you know at least I know it's alive and well and reachable through the network yeah and that's kind of in contrast to maybe having to keep like a spreadsheet uh, of different IP addresses that might change over time or having to go look at you know DHCP logs or something like that right so um, yeah right. again that's another great use case all right, so um, with the access points, I, I want to kind of you know pivot from that. Let's talk about a little bit about the switches, and this is kind of a great segue. So you can see here that uh, this access point is actually plugged into a switch here called the IS2-1. So I'm, I'm assuming that's probably some switch closet, right? Uh, and this is actually plugged into port two. Right? So what we're doing here is we're using CDP and LDP information. These are kind of network communication protocols uh, that can share information about the, uh, the device that's on the other end of the cable. Right, So we can actually use that information to our advantage and actually tell you exactly where it's plugged into. So we're using a Meraki switch and we can even tell you if that switch is online or offline. Right, So let me kind of take a step back through this. I want to like walk you through kind of a, a, an example here. So if we were going to go look at you know maybe this specific client and we were to say, okay, you know what, I want to walk through everything from when you know this particular client touches the network all the way out until they reach the uh, internet right and that's where we've built this topology page so you'll notice here again back from a client page we can click on topology from here and what this is going to do is it's going to bring us into our brand new topology page and when I say brand new I really mean it's about six months old but this is a very useful feature so check this out what what it's done is it's filled out the MAC address of that access point as a filter and now what it's doing is it's tracing from the access point through the switches all the way out to the gateway. Okay, so now I know exactly what path stands between my student and the internet everywhere I would need to troubleshoot if there was a potential issue. So I understand like that's a little grayed out, might be a little hard to see that. I'll delete the filter here just so you can see the full live network map. This is a feature that is built out using Meraki switching, and you, I didn't have to upload a Visio diagram, or I didn't have to like draw lines here and connect everything up. This is all dynamically generated every single time uh, you load the page. So uh, we can see kind of uh, the health of all the devices, exactly where they're plugged in on the network, uh, you know, the health of all the switches behind it. Um, you know, so uh, Bernie, have you ever had to kind of make any Visio diagrams after this feature came out? Well, the creepy part is that I did make a Visio diagram, and I spent several hours designing it, and then this came out a few months later, and it looks almost identical to my Visio diagram. So, you know, it was it was kind of like, oh my God, well they look what they did. Um, but yeah, it's it's a really great representation of of our network and how it works. Uh, we have um, core switches in in each of the building, and then they go out to um, uh, you know. Some smaller closets w within the building. 
uh, and we do, you know, we try to name everything logically so that we can figure out like ES core one is in the elementary school and it's the, the first core switch. So uh, that's just a, a personal naming scheme that, that we've used for years here and it works well for us. Excellent. Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously for schools when, you know, it's a smaller team kind of managing this infrastructure, right? It's pretty useful to know exactly, you know, where things are plugged in on the network, especially if you need to troubleshoot something remotely. Um, so um, I'm really happy that uh, you did actually try to draw a visual diagram. In a, in a past life of mine, uh, I was actually the person responsible for maintaining visual diagrams, and uh, you know I pretty much hated every iteration of it. So um, this is some pretty powerful stuff. And the last thing I'll kind of point out here is this is not just a network map. You'll notice that these are also green, right? And they're not arbitrarily green. They're not like green for Meraki Green or something like that. That actually means they're online. You know, for example, this is an access point that's offline. You know, uh, we can see. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you should see a red one in here as well. Yeah, down the very there, bottom, there right? So, um, yeah, so again, just a, a ton of good information here. All right, so um, all right, so last thing that I do want to touch on here, and, I, and for this, uh, I will have to kind of uh, jump back over to um, actually, sorry, one last thing that I want to talk about on the switching is the switch ports page. So I, I would be totally remiss if I didn't mention this. Um, the switch ports page is a, a great kind of breakdown of every single switch port uh, on the network, right? So what the reason that's kind of cool to expand this view out is that you know, if you have a large switch infrastructure, you know, such as this one, Bernie here is managing actually a little over. 2,200 ports, right? So, and you know, we talked about you know trying to provision these switch ports and making sure that everyone has access to the services that they want to have access to. This is a great way to kind of be able to bulk configure that tool set. So, if just as an example here, say you know tomorrow Bernie you know decides he needs to configure port 10 across like every single one of his switches. So he has 48 switches. 48 port 10s, right? Uh, and now we can see I've searched for port 10. That's let's actually bringing it up across each one of our switches. And now we can actually, you know, if we need to make some bulk changes to this, I can expand this out and say, hey, you know what? I want to configure this all at once. I'm going to click edit here. I'm going to update 48 ports across 48 different switches, and I can modify all that at once. So think about how you'd have to do this with another vendor, right? You'd have to log in to switch by switch, navigate to the interface, change whatever you wanted to change, save the changes. Now maybe you have to configuration manage those changes right now you got to take that configuration upload it into some third-party tool however you do this just to make sure that you're not kind of overriding someone else's changes you know this is a you know it could be very very complex and now by the way you know repeat that 47 more times right so this type of uh, this type of functionality is, is very very powerful hey Ryan can I jump in for a second are you, are yeah, you hearing absolutely. me okay yeah. good I I know that I had some sound issues and apparently that's fixed um, that has been huge for me. Um, the system that I had before this was, uh, I mean, clunky was was an understatement for adjusting VLANs, which I do a lot. Um, I'll put an access point on, and and I'll need to tag it to different VLANs, and that feature you just showed, I use it more, uh, because my network's already configured, I use it more on an individual basis. Um, but I, I can take a access point uh, in the uh, in the middle school, for example, and I can tag it to the high school VLAN, so it'll act like it's in the high school. And that has value to me, because I'll, I'll switch things around, or I'll test to see, you know, how would this thing behave in the high school without leaving my desk here in the middle school. So uh, tagging and untagging VLANs, um, and, and being, uh, we also use IP phones here. And uh, making, uh, you may want to just highlight that um, you, you actually have a, a voice VLAN uh, feature that's very easy. You just slip in the voice VLAN for the phone, and boom, it's online. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let, me, let me find one here that's not a, not an uplink here. Um, yeah, so as soon as you, and I, I promise you, uh, Bernie, I won't save these changes. Uh, as soon as you change yeah, something thanks. to, uh, <laughs> uh, as soon as Especially you change Especially on to, that switch. <laughs> yeah, as soon as you change something to an access port, right, you'll notice that we can do VLAN and voice VLAN advertisements from uh, the same switch port, right? So you can kind of uh, do, a, a, you know, a one single cable out to a VoIP phone. Uh, and uh, you know, have it uh, the voice traffic automatically end up on the voice V then, and, and it works good. Um, we have um, I, I'm going to guess 50 IP phones. We're we're building that out, um, and the old way of doing it was I mean it was horrible. It was bad. 
um, and with this with the voice VLAN feature, which is I think it's been out for a while now. Uh, it's just simple. You you throw in the voice VLAN and away you go. Excellent. All right. So uh, before we kind of kick over the questions, I do just want to highlight a few things on the security appliance, and and I know we we kind of uh, you know didn't even get a chance to get into MDM today, but hopefully you know we'll, I'll, I'll touch on a few things there during the Q and A section. Uh, so real quick on the security appliance, just to highlight the things that are kind of obviously important to schools: content filtering, right? So uh, just so you know, I'm back on uh, our Meraki network here. Uh, so content filtering, you know, the, co the cool thing about our security appliance is we've taken a lot of functionality and kind of collapsed it into one box. Right, so this this single box is now going to be your your content filter, your IDS IPS, your malware detection. Right, so you know being able to secure your entire network from the firewall perspective, uh, but while also kind of having some cool features here for for K through 12 as well. So of course category filtering here, um, they're integrated with a company called BrightCloud. They do all of the categorization for us. So as new URLs are starting to come out uh, and, and fall into those categories, that company is working you know night and day to continually categorize them. So you pretty much set the categories once and you can forget about it. Uh, there's no updates that you need to do. Anytime there's a new update for us, uh, we can automatically set that. And you'll notice the category list size, you can actually do a full list. So basically like every URL they've ever seen in these categories will be will be checked again. So obviously the only really customers I do recommend that for uh, is for, for schools, right? Because obviously we can't have any of this content getting through. Um, there's also web search filtering, right? So if you need to uh, you know, do web search filtering and basically block adult content from being returned uh, in encrypted searches, we can do that as well, right? So uh, this is you know for a little bit more secure uh, content through the search engines there. And then finally here, we can actually block encrypted search altogether if we would like. Uh, we also do have YouTube for Schools integration. I know they just kind of re Brandis, um, so it's no longer called YouTube for Schools, uh, but essentially this is a, a a mechanism where you can control the content that is available on YouTube, so it's kind of strictly limited to education content. So um, real quick, I you know I know we're going to kind of run out of time here, folks, and I do want to get to all your questions. So uh, you know, Systems Manager, just to give you kind of a quick breakdown here, Systems Manager is a, another product that we have that is uh, used to kind of manage uh, mobile devices, right? So and we can actually switch back over to Bernie's network here, and uh, he does have a Systems Manager network live here. So what we can do is we install an agent on these devices, and what that allows you to do is kind of not only remotely monitor these devices, but in some cases, depending on the platform allows you to push down restrictions to the devices or push down applications to the devices. So if you're talking about, you know, managing like, hey, how do I manage a thousand tablets if they arrive tomorrow, right? Uh, you know, we have a lot of nifty tools here built into System Manager to allow you to take advantage of that. So, um, you know, there are some questions that popped up, um, you know, uh, you know, about systems managers such as, you know, can we uh, disable, uh, you know, letting a student turn the Wi-Fi off and, and that, you know, there's some, it depends on the platform, right? And it kind of brings up an important distinction here with systems manager. We essentially have all the buttons and knobs that the different platforms allow us to have, right? So different platforms have, you know, different uh, capabilities so far and, you know, today, in today's world, Apple is kind of leading the charge in this. They have the, the most buttons and knobs to be able to kind of control on their devices and they also have the kind of the the most diverse kind of uh, portfolio in terms of uh, you know uh, management tools for all those devices and, and enabling MDM solutions to have real granular control. Um, so j just remember that Systems Manager is there to be as an asset tracking system. It's there to be um, as a uh, you know a configuration type of tool. Uh, we're continually building out new support for different products here and adding a new functionality uh, to this product line. So uh, the one cool thing about Systems Manager that I will throw out there is actually it's a hundred percent free when you have less than a hundred devices. So if this is something you you know you weren't you didn't necessarily want to commit to, but you want to try out for uh, you know a period of time, you know it, it, play go ahead play around with it. Hundred devices you can enroll up to a hundred devices for absolutely free. Um, so definitely definitely encourage you to take advantage of that. So at this point, guys, uh, we do have about five minutes left, so I want to open it up to questions, uh, and so we'll kind of pause here to take a peek at that.
All right, so one of the questions was, can you can you do filtering, uh, you know, at the AP level? Um, that, that's a great question. So yeah, absolutely. On our access points, we do have, uh, you know, basically a firewall and traffic shipping page where we can kind of do layer seven filtering, right? So if we want to say for a particular SSID, let's go ahead and block some, you know, P2P traffic, or we want to block, you know, uh, you know, you guys are feeling. You know, you want to crush all the students and block Facebook. Um, you can do that at at an access point level, so you don't necessarily need a Meraki firewall to do that. Um, also, traffic shaping, right? If you want to throttle that traffic as as opposed to blocking it, you know, coming in here and and basically creating a rule to throttle um, that type of traffic. So, say we want to throttle. Um, you know, Netflix. Uh, we can come in here, create a rule for Netflix, and say, hey, you know what? This is going to be throttled down to, you know, one meg per second, right? So all that can be done on the access point level. Uh, let's see here. Let's another. Let's pick another one here. Another question was about proxy settings for content filtering. So um, when you set that to full list, it actually does do a proxy uh, for the content filter. Yeah, she's out to bright cloud servers and, and to do that lookup and as, as opposed to us having to download uh, you know every single URL in existence uh, so there's that type of thing I hope hopefully that answers your question Anthony if not uh, yeah let me know So there was another question um, about user administration, right? So um, yeah, so user administration is, is pretty granular with the dashboard, right? We can do things like you know have a dashboard level admins for you know a particular network. So you, if you have multiple schools in your within your district, and say, okay, I want this particular user managing these networks. I want a different user managing net these networks. We of course have like read write privileges or read only privileges um, for switch ports you can actually set you know different admin manage different switch ports uh, we're also coming out with the uh, ability for like different admins to manage different SSIDs and pre-shared keys um, so there's just a, you know, a ton of granularity there Another question was, you know, does does Meraki work with Catalyst switches? And and the answer to that is unfortunately no, right? So this is a a, a the, you know the dashboard and all the feature set that we build out of the dashboard is really meant to be working with Meraki switches. Uh, another question was like, can you do local configuration? Is and yeah, absolutely. Like Bernie mentioned, there is some local configuration that you can do uh, on the switches in terms of getting it online. Um, uh, and just to clarify on that last question, you know, we do absolutely interoperate with uh, with Catalyst switches. So if you just want to get, at, you know, Meraki access points or something like that, each of our products, whether it be systems manager, security blinds, wireless switching, all of them are, are completely interdependent. Are interdependent? They're completely dependent. No, they're not dependent. I don't know what I'm trying to say. They do not rely on any other Meraki equipment in order to function. So uh, interoperable, that's what I'm saying. They, be, they we can work, for, work with any other vendor. We're completely standards-based. Uh, there's no kind of, you know, oh, you have to have, we, we want to kind of force you to buy Meraki switching in order to use a Meraki access point. There's none of, the, none of those interdependencies. Uh, one question was about licensing, and it does look like we answered that. But yeah, the licensing model is very simple. So for every device, you need a license for that device. Uh, um, so we could get into a little bit more about that. But unfortunately, we are running out of time. Bernie, thank you so much for, for uh, attending today and, and adding all that very, very valuable um, experience that you've had with your network. And uh, very, very happy to have you on. Yeah, it's it's my pleasure, uh, and you know people are are free to email me as as well if if you have a specific education question or how do you do this or how do you do that I'm I'm fine with that. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Bernie, and again, thank you everyone else for attending today. Uh, we will uh, be wrapping up here shortly. Uh, there will be a survey sent out after. Definitely take advantage and provide us some great feedback. Um, any questions that we didn't get a chance to answer, they will get sent over to your sales rep. So definitely feel free to reach out to us uh, for more information, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you very much, everyone.